All right, why don't we get started for this? Uh, we could go on with this for a while. So why don't we get started? Welcome. Good to see everyone tonight. Uh, so last week, last week was a big week. I covered a ton of material last week. I, I feel like we have a bit of a breather tonight. I feel like it's a bit more of a relaxed pace. We'll see what happens. But last week we talked about, if you recall, we, mostly Philip, who was one of the deacons of the church, as he spread the gospel to uh, the Samaritans and to that Ethiopian in a chari uh, chariot. And this week we're going to see the gospel first spread to the Gentiles, and then we're going to see some, I guess, church meetings, sort of. It'll be more interesting than it sounds when I say church meetings. So that's what we'll be looking at tonight, and I think we should be able to get to it without too much issue. But why don't we open up in prayer? Lord, I thank you for this night. I thank you for everyone who was able to make it out. I just pray that you'd be with us during this time and that we would uh, perhaps see something in your word that uh, maybe we haven't seen before or just see it in a new way that would help us understand your heart for uh, the gospel and reaching the lost better than we currently see it. Uh, so I just pray that you'd be with us during this time and open your word to us. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, so if you don't know, we're on page 63. That's where we're going to start, although we're not actually reading anything on page 63. So, I don't know exactly what, do you guys have opening questions on, on your first page? Yes. yes. What are your opening questions? Okay, can you repeat that louder? Well, I guess everyone can read it on, in their books. Yeah, what are some, uh, yeah, the, the book recorded mine differently for some reason. But yeah, what are some, actually, can you repeat that mostly for me? Okay, common obstacles w witnessing to hard to reach people. First, what on earth is a hard to reach person? Yeah, that's tricky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could be, yeah. Yeah, uh, as humorous as the first example was, like that's legitimate too. Distance, physicality, um, could be closed-minded. Well, what else do you think would make someone like hard to reach for the gospel? How so? Mm, okay. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Mm. Oh, yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, language could definitely be a factor. Okay. Mm. Okay. Prior personal experiences were good for them, so they Yeah. Something from religion left a bad taste in their mouth, some bad church experience, or tragedy, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, so there's a lot of different reasons someone could be considered hard to reach. And really, last week, we looked at the conversion of a few people who we would consider hard to reach, like someone like Simon the Sorcerer, even Saul, who we looked at more in depth, someone adamantly opposed to the faith, then converts. And today, we're going to be looking at Gentiles, like I said, who, for a host of other reasons, are difficult to reach with the gospel, uh, but we do see the gospel going forward. So we're going to look at that. So why don't we start on page 64 in your book? Uh, They do a nice little recap here, so I think this will be helpful. A recap of what's going to happen. So summary, that's the word I'm looking for. There's a paragraph that starts with, Uh, While Peter was a central figure in the early church, Luke never described him as the head or resident leader of the church at Jerusalem. In fact, Peter had a rather itinerant type of ministry. He was only one of the twelve apostles, all of whom had received a distinct ministry from the Lord. Lydda was located in the fertile coastal plain of Sharon, about 25 miles northwest of Jerusalem. We have no record of how the gospel reached that area, only that believers lived in that area. While in Lydda, Peter met a paralytic man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas is a Greek name, indicating that the man was probably a Hellenistic Jew. Uh, Continuing on, uh, without request from Aeneas, Peter instantly and completely healed the man by calling on the name of Jesus. Peter had similarly healed a paralytic. Perhaps Luke recorded the second healing miracle, to illustrate that as the gospel witness expanded outside Jerusalem, it did so with equal power to that within Jerusalem. Making this point, Luke was slowly preparing the reader for the spread of the gospel to the uttermost part of the earth and the salvation of the Gentiles outside of Jerusalem and Judea. Okay. So I just wanted to read that from the book because that would have taken quite a few verses and while it's a significant any healing is a significant thing in the Bible. It's not doctrinally vital to what we're going to be looking at. But why don't you dig in with me to Acts chapter 9. We'll start at verse 36. But can I get one volunteer to look up Mark 5, 41 and read that when we get to it? Can anyone do that? Okay. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to give you a cue, but that's good. So, <laughs> okay. So, keep that loaded in your mind. That was a quick read. Maybe we'll jump back to it. Uh, everyone else in Acts 9 36. Now, there was at Joppa uh, a certain disciple named Tabitha which by interpretation is called Dorcas, this woman was full of good works and alms deeds which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as Lydda was nigh unto Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. When Peter arose and went with them, when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping, and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made, while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth, and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And when she opened, and she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand, and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a Tanner. Uh, do you still have Mark by chance? <laughs> Could you read that again for us, please? <laughs> Very dramatic rendering. I appreciate it. 
Okay, so, now one, this is a kind of quick miracle from Peter. It doesn't take up a whole lot of space in the text. Of course, it's a huge miracle. He, this woman died. She was some very generous, nice, saintly woman in the church who passed away. Peter's close by. They call him to Joppa, and he comes and prays over her, and she's brought back to life. Now, the reason I asked you to read Mark, if you're reading in the Greek, and some translations, or like some, some Bibles might even just put it in like a, a little footnote or something, there's a really interesting thing that's happening in those texts where in Mark, that's Jesus going into a room with this uh, young girl who had passed away, and he did the same thing. He put everyone out, he prayed, and she came back to life. And Mark goes out of his way to record the Aramaic words that Jesus would have spoke, which is something like uh, Talitha kume. And it's very interesting that Luke takes the time to record this miracle that looks a lot like what Jesus did. And the woman's name is Tabitha. And in, in the language, he's basically saying, Tabitha kume? So with Jesus, uh, Talitha was the word for like young girl, something like that. And even though this is, Tabitha is the woman's name, an ancient reader who's going through, you know, reading, reading the miracles of Jesus, then they start reading the early church in, in the book of Acts, you have these situations that look extremely similar, so much so that the language is almost identical, and you have the same miracle happening. So why did I bring up technical Aramaic stuff in the text? Um, because I'm going to try to do this as often as I can when it comes up, that the early church looked like Jesus. And Luke goes out of his way to present this story. The Spirit goes out of his way to show you these weird little, not weird, these, these little examples where what the apostles are doing looks so much like what Jesus is doing that Sometimes they're almost word for word the same because they're presented showing you Jesus is still at work through his disciples, through the early church, and the early church at its best looks like Jesus. So, yeah, that's what's going on there. That's why I wanted to bring that up. And notice the last thing that happens, uh, verse 43, it's not a big deal, but came to pass that as he, he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. So Simon Peter is staying with Simon the tanner. I'm not looking for a play on words there. There's nothing there that I know of. But the man is a, a tanner. So he will take the hides of animals and preserve them in leather work and all sorts of stuff like that. Historically, the Jews would consider a type of person like that there's nothing wrong with them, but as far as ritual cleanliness goes and like touching the bodies of dead things and working with carcasses, very ritually unsound. Like you're probably going to be ritually unclean a lot in that profession. So the whole thing is kind of like, well, we just, obviously the, the Jewish people need leather and clothes and stuff like that, but it was kind of like, you just, you just keep that to the side. We don't really deal with that. And as Peter is in Joppa, which is, more Gentile territory, he's staying with someone who the Jews would consider like kind of ritually unclean, kind of out of that fold. So you're watching even Peter's ministry coming from Jerusalem. Now he's in Gentile territory, staying with someone that the Jews would consider ritually unclean. And this is where his ministry is springing from as we start here. I want to look at question six, but I think we may have answered some of this. Question six on page 65 of your book. Who are some people believers today would most likely not associate with and would not think to share the gospel with? I don't even have any good ideas here. I'm just curious. See what you think. Mm -hmm. um, 
Sure. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything else spring to mind? Sure. 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 Hmm. Those smarty pants, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we don't need to go diving headlong into that. I just think it's interesting that, like, you know, we see some of this stuff from the ancient world, and we're like, oh, you, they didn't associate with tanners. That's silly. That's, you know, these different class distinctions and different things. And we go, yeah, if we think hard enough, that that, that exists. Like, that we, we're not that advanced as a people. You know, we, we still have these same kind of issues. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, so ancient, what's up? A couple of weeks ago, um, when those guys got together and killed the world's son, and the men took him out. Yeah, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when Ananias and Sapphira died, yeah. 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 No. <laughs> well, I mean, it was the Holy Spirit who did it, so it's okay. Yeah, God. Yeah. <laughs> sure, but they were inside. It was in church. It was, you know, it's like this leaving someone, you know, you can't do that. You got to take them out back. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, an interesting common ancient Israelite burial practice that I wish we could still kind of do today, but most people probably don't is yeah it would basically be your family and they would typically you know whatever ritual they had involved with that but they would bury you in like a roughly two foot grave very shallow and let you decompose for about a year or two and then dig you up when you were just bones and then they would typically have a family ossuary where they would just have massive collections of like the family members you know yeah, it's a sufficiently morbid practice. Yeah, okay. Sorry, <laughs> tangents. That's on me. <laughs> Any other questions about death, please? <laughs> An ossuary? Yeah. What's the It's a. Yeah. Sometimes it could become like a. Um, like a crypt type thing, if it was like the whole dis distended family. Um, yeah, got you. It's probably where it comes from. <laughs> All right, page 66 in your book. Um, actually, turn there, but we'll get there in a couple minutes. We have to go to the text first. 
All right, so we know Peter is in Joppa, so look with me in Acts 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian Band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming uh, in to him and saying unto him, Cornelius, when he had looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges, he lodges with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spoke to Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them, that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. All right, that's pretty straightforward, but I'll throw it open to any, any thoughts. Oh, yeah. Peter, or Simon, surname Peter. Simon the Tanner by the seaside, yeah, yeah, basically gave him coordinates, you know, yeah. I just a lot of, a lot of times, just so understanding, a lot, a lot of times how you read it. Yeah. You know, if I was praying to me who showed up and told me what to do, I was yeah. thinking like, what is this? Yeah. Of little faith. Yeah, I would just picture the most caricature Italian man that you possibly can, probably with a bowl of spaghetti on the side, like just full Italian. That's that's what was going on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, so a uh, so a centurion would be a centurion, or yeah, um, is someone who would be over roughly a hundred soldiers in the Roman army. Yeah, so that, that's what a centurion would be. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, did what he was told. Probably. Everything all right? I feel like we're losing some control here. Everything good? <laughs> okay, okay. I got you. I got you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, he is a some sort of leader over a hundred soldiers. That's what the centurion is. Now, you notice... He's Italian, as Ron pointed out. So he's not Jewish, he's a Gentile, and he is someone who, in some form, knows about the God of Israel and is committed to him in some way and is doing good works in the name of this God. He's giving to the poor, he's in prayer. Uh, this is interesting, and I'm sure, depending on how you wanted to take the Greek here, you could probably get the technical term that the Jews would call a God-fearer, which I think we've talked about before, uh, which is exactly what Cornelius is, a Gentile man. He is not a Jewish convert, because that, that would be a different thing, but he is a God-fearer, and this is the man that the angel appears to. 
Uh, now that part, uh, page 66 in your book. There's a paragraph that starts with, Cornelius was a centurion of the Italian band. He served as a non-commissioned officer who commanded about 100 soldiers in Caesarea. Caesarea, located on the Mediterranean coast, about 30 miles north of Joppa, served as a center for Roman government and military affairs. Its population differed greatly from the heavily Jewish populations of Lydda and Joppa. Okay, so that gives us a little background, helps you understand a little bit about that city, what's going on there. So question seven in your book. I like the question, but I want to tweak it. So it says, how easy would it have been for Peter to overlook a centurion in the Roman army? And I think we can ask that, how easy would it have been, but why would that have been easy? Why would that be someone he would avoid? Not a fan of the Romans, yeah. Yeah, and honestly, like, what other opportunity would he have had to interact with this person? You know, he's in a different city. He seems to speak, I don't know, we'll, we'll get to it about, like, language. But, yeah, it's, it's not someone that you would expect the Jewish people to be interacting with in a faith-based encounter in any sort of positive way whatsoever. Uh, but that's what's going to take place. So we can continue on with the story in Acts 10, verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spoke unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made uh, inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. All right, initial thoughts on that. What jumps out at you? Yeah, a lot going on there. Does he come out of what? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it would seem that when he is going back down, you know, Spirit tells him to. I got you. Yeah. Having the angel appear. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he puts it for the Yeah. Yeah. Interesting when you tell your tongue. Yeah. Why do you think that's important? Yeah, Cornelius had his vision the ninth hour, which is three in the afternoon. Peter's having his vision at the sixth hour the following day, which is noon. That's why Peter is very hungry. It, it's just like a funny little comment. <laughs> um, yeah, he, he's sitting up on the roof. He's praying. He's hungry. They're still making the food. It's taking a while. Then all this happens. What's up? 
Visions, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This is a nice way mm-hmm. to help him. It's the bridge. Yeah. Building a bridge so he can actually, I guess, do this with confidence. Mm-hmm. Uh, being with somebody who normally, even if he wasn't a security, he still normally would be with a Gentile. Right. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like it's pretty important to his Cornelius himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so we have the sixth hour. We have the strange vision of basically a giant sheet being let down from the skies, filled with animals of every kind you can imagine. The voice telling him to rise, kill, and eat, which is odd enough, but especially to a devout Jewish man who has been eating kosher his entire life, Uh, These things are anathema to him. And then the cryptic message of what God has cleansed, don't call common or unclean. This happens three times. And you notice this time Peter is confused, which actually gives me a shred of hope and confidence in life. (laughs) That like, you know, there are so many of these miraculous things in the Bible, visions of God, visions of like in, you know, the prophets and all sorts of things. And seems like they always know what's going on. And then you have Peter, who's just like, sees a vision, hears the voice of God, still has no idea what to make of it yet. And it's kind of like, God is probably working in your life in a far less dramatic fashion. Maybe it's okay that we're confused sometimes, too. You know, that, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And you would imagine that that is a fairly important reassurance as a Roman soldier and two servants are knocking up at the place where Peter has been staying. Peter has not had the best track record with the law thus far. So it's good that he gets that assurance from God. So why don't we jump ahead to verse 24, because He goes with the soldier to meet Cornelius. Cornelius recounts his entire vision to Peter, so we don't need to reread that. So yeah, Acts 10, verse 24. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with them, and went in, and found that many were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful thing, it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew, to keep company, or to come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, and soon as I uh, was sent for, I ask, therefore, for what intent have you sent for me? Okay. Slightly confused in my chronology. This is the point where Cornelius is going to tell him the entire vision, the angel, all that. Okay. All right, jump to verse 34. Okay. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after uh, after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the, of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things, which he both did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. 
and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. All right, short little sermon there. Anything jump out at you? Yeah. Yeah, so these are the first Gentiles we have hearing the gospel. They clearly believe the gospel. The Spirit comes, and then they're baptized. And like we said, uh, I kind of previewed it for you last week. We had the event of Pentecost for the Jewish believers. We had the apostles coming to the believers in Samaria, and the Spirit coming in a unique way. And then with these first uh, Gentiles, you know, all the nations, you have this their own little Pentecost event where the Spirit comes in a very miraculous fashion and sort of baptizes the nations, if you will, into the church as it spreads out. So, yeah, Luke's order that he set up, that Jesus set up for them, is being played out here. Yeah. Yeah, anything else that, that you noticed? Yeah. He was just telling them to just re- assuming something new, he's just saying it so they remember. He's not saying it in surprise of himself, correct? Hmm. That's because, a good question. Because I would just think that because he's pretty smart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it seems. So after he has this vision, after he's confused about it, and God tells him, "Hey, go with these people. I've got this worked out. It's fine. Go with them." He he clearly knows. Okay, he's going to meet with some Roman, probably centurion. I he probably talked to the soldier. He was traveling 30 miles uh, back to the city with. And then he's clearly worked out what God meant with the vision. Like, he, he finally understands this, this whole Jewish separation that I've been operating under was good for its time under the law, but now the law has been fulfilled because the Messiah has come. And that same spirit that would keep him from abstaining from certain foods and uh, certain practices and certain things of, you know, associating with non-Jewish people, he goes, oh, okay, so I'm understanding that the law has been fulfilled here, you know. His vision gives him the confidence that, okay, now the, the artificial barriers that stood between me and the nations are broken down. So it almost seems like, yeah, to, to answer your question and not just keep rambling about this, it seems like he, it's almost like he's making the theological point, whether he's, he could be, like, he's probably surprised by it because he didn't know what it meant in the first place and he's never once in his life witnessed to a Gentile. So it's probably a new thing for him, too, as he's unraveling, like, oh, yeah, this is actually what God has for the mission of his people. And I'm sure Cornelius and the God-fearing Gentiles also know what interactions with the Jews are typically like. Um, So yeah, it it seems to mark that new stage in the development of the early church where they go from being like Jewish people who found the Messiah to this new 
international thing that is the spread of the kingdom to all nations on the earth. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, both. Kind of, yeah, probably. Yeah. Mm. So, I would say this is a clarifier to that. Um, so one, our, none of us are like ethnically Jewish here, right? I mean, a little bit, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's okay, um, it, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so like, as the rest of us, you know, Gentiles, like we never had dietary laws anyway, like it was just for the Jewish people. Um, yeah, so it's really, it's under the ministry of Jesus that he is the one who fulfills the law and then like that, it's not the requirement going forward. I would say this is a good clarifying text. This is that in action. And it really becomes a thing in action when he starts moving beyond the Jewish world into the Gentiles. And the church is still going to have problems with this for another 20 to 50 years, as, you, as we see in the letters, still Jewish believers struggling to integrate Gentile believers and vice versa, because they're still sticking to different cultural standards. Um, Plus, there's a lot of Jews who never took them as Messiah, so right, they're sure. they're right. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Gentiles being able to be, I don't even know what the word would be, saved. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, um, being with people who are called unclean. Yeah. Yeah, so you're dealing with a lot of ritual purity stuff that was a big part of Israel's story as it was keeping the people of God preserved and following God in the scriptures until the Messiah would come. And then everything just really changes with the resurrection. So, yeah. Yeah, good question. Probably. Possibly. Yeah, it's definitely setting up Peter as a leader in the early church. Um, and even though we were talking about this this morning, me and Pastor, Peter's ministry is difficult to track after the book of Acts. He's, he is fairly itinerant. We know he's in Rome at some point. But other than that, he's, he's kind of on the run, moving around, kind of a little less public than like Paul, who's running all over the Asia, like preaching in marketplaces and stuff. Um, yeah, probably. There's, there's probably a connection there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard for us to understand this kind of stuff because yeah. we don't we don't act like we're like Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so right. when we, when I read this stuff, it's like, to me, it's like, you know, they're making a big deal out of something. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Well, I, I think it's difficult in a, in a time and place where we are 2,000 years beyond this, because there's, like, even using racism as a word, is almost a little too modern because it's more of like, it's like ethno-nationalism because back then the Jewish people worshiped the God of Israel and the Romans worshiped the Roman gods and the Greeks, you know, like, it, so the idea that someone who is outside of Israel is worshiping the God of Israel to them is like, what are you even talking about? Like, why would you do that? 
Um, and the Jewish people going, well, yeah, our, our Messiah is going to come. The Jewish Messiah is going to come. What do the Gentiles have to do with that? Because they sort of forget some of the stipulations of the promises to Abraham and that the Messiah was to come to bless the entire world and bring the world under the sovereignty of God. So, yeah, it's, it's operating in a very different space than we tend to. Yeah. Because ever since what Moses, they they killed the day of God's people yeah. and the word of God's people. Right. Kind of mm-hmm. Right. But, but not quite. You know, right? No, I got you. Yeah, they didn't have to look Jewish. Yeah. Um, Yeah, and that's going to continue to create conflict in this book and going forward. Um, Okay, so, man, I thought we had so much time. There's still so much left. This got away from me. Um, Okay. Okay, the only thing that I will add to the gospel presentation that we read from Peter is, if you noticed, it wasn't all that Jewish of a gospel presentation, if I can say it that way. Like when he talks to the people at Pentecost who are Jews gathered in Jerusalem, it's all very central to what's going on in Jerusalem. He's talking about, you know, like he's using some history. Uh, We saw Stephen in his response, he used like all the history of the Jewish people to make his point. He was talking about laws and Moses and the prophets and this and that. And Peter, as he's talking to the Gentiles, he knows he's talking to Gentiles. And the core of the gospel is 100% there of who Jesus is, what he did. God raised him from the dead to bring, you know, uh, forgiveness for sins. Like, the gospel is there, and it's not layered with, like, a hundred different layers of in-depth Jewish history that, that they wouldn't have as Gentiles. So he's, he's definitely direct, like he, he knows who he's talking to and we'll see this throughout the book of Acts, especially the further we get from Jerusalem. Uh, Paul will end up doing this, like they end up adapting how they tell the core message of the gospel. Like the, the core stays the same always, but the, the apostles are intelligent enough and real enough to know like who they're talking to and what they will and won't understand and what groundwork has to be laid and explained and what is not vital at that initial juncture. So it's interesting, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so man, we're basically out of time. We can wrap up Peter and Cornelius and I'll deal with things next week. Um, I'll show you, so Acts 11, uh, verses 1 through 4. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and didst eat with them? But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, and he gives the entire story that we just talked about. Jump to verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John, John the Baptist, indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? 
When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Hmm. Yeah, we only have a few minutes. Any, any, it's quick. Any thoughts on that? They don't have to be. I just thought I'd ask. Yeah, yeah, they listened to him. Took him a minute. Yeah. It's just another example of like, my surprise at their surprise. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. You know, we've always looked with reverence generally with the disciples and apostles. Mm-hmm. But yet at times they don't seem to get things or yeah. you know, along the way there's like a real journey for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and at this stage in the church, it is still new. It's, an, it's a new thing. Um, Cornelius is the first, like, this is the first real excursion into the Gentile world, if we can put it that way. Um, yeah, and, and the Jewish people are still grappling with the fact that the Jewish Messiah is for all people, you know, not just the Jews. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. So once they absorbed it, they conceived. Yeah. 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 Well, because, you know, we just saw the event with Simon Peter and Simon the sorcerer last week. We know that, like, Peter doesn't have control over the Holy Spirit. Like, he came and laid his hands on some people, and God sent the Holy Spirit. He doesn't have he doesn't actually have the power to do with it what he will because it's the Holy Spirit. It's, it's God. And it's interesting in this situation, Peter just preached. He just preached like God told him to and the Holy Spirit came and he's like, well, what do you want me to do about it? Who, who was I to fight against this? And they say, oh, okay, you know, and they, they praise God and they go, okay, I guess this is what's happening. It's going out to the Gentiles. And uh, yeah, the book will take a shift more or less from here on out as it focuses on the mission to the Gentile world. Um, but I thought it was interesting was when Jesus had um, said to the centurion, remember when he was mm-hmm. saying that? Oh, yeah. Was that his son was dying. Mm-hmm. So, and you wonder the word got back or mm-hmm. something when that happened to, to set this up. Or yeah. With this, the centurion. Mm-hmm. Or yeah, no, that's true. Couldn't be the same guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, but yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I will find a way to cover what we need to next week. Um, yeah, a few different things. Mostly little stuff, but important stuff. Um, so yeah, any, uh, any more comments, questions, thoughts? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you notice Peter quoted Jesus. He's like, oh, I remember what Jesus said about John the Baptist. And it seems like this side of the cross, a lot of what Jesus said finally starts making sense to them. And as they're doing the kingdom work of, of spreading the gospel. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a really important chapter, even though like Peter's, Peter's mission to the Gentiles is short-lived. It's mostly going to be Paul and his mission to the Gentiles. But As we just discussed a few minutes ago, we are almost 100% a Gentile audience here. So, like, we are the direct beneficiaries of what's going on here. Like, wherever, whatever part of the world you originally ancestrally come from, the fact that 
you now, from that people group living on the other side of the ocean, worship the God of Israel, and Israel's Messiah is like, that's no small feat. That's baffling, especially just the way, the way this works. It, it's pretty crazy. So we're the beneficiaries, beneficiaries of this. Um, and we see that God wants his message to spread. He went to extreme lengths with angels and visions and crossing all sorts of historic cultural boundaries to make this first convert among Cornelius. And yeah, kind of makes, should probably make us think a little bit about like, yeah, you think God still does stuff like that today? Like, okay, no matter your opinion on visions and angels and stuff, does God set up like divine appointments to allow us to speak words of life to people, to speak, you know, to be a witness, to be someone who can present the gospel, whether it's in word or deed or just however we end up being a witness to someone? Like, like does God still do this kind of stuff? I would. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of yeses. I would think very much yes. Um. I think that, like, in the beginning, when you were talking about people that are hard to reach, I think mm. it's interesting that, like, how they, it was a time, there was a time when it might have even been that the, the Jewish people might have even been harder to reach. Mm. Mm-hmm. What do you mean you can? Um, what do you mean you had uncircumcised people in your house? Like all mm-hmm. these things that they've been taught their whole life, and um, you know, and trying to convince them that well, this is a this is a new thing now. Mm-hmm. You know, and that so that might even be better harder to reach them. Well, yeah. I guess it is. I guess we still have yeah. Jewish people that haven't been preached. Yeah. Yeah. No, I got you. Yeah, and, and that's actually an interesting point that, like, we th- you'd think, like, your Roman centurion would be hard to reach. And God went to great lengths to reach him, so, like, that's nothing disputing that. But then, like, okay, you're a Jewish person who grew up with the law and the prophets and the, the history of the Jewish people and the God of Israel. Many of them don't end up accepting the Messiah, And it's kind of like in our culture, like we had a few examples of people who we might consider hard to reach, and we go, ah, you know, I'm not, why even, you know, bother ministering to this person, witnessing? It's like, are they really likely to come to God? And it's like, you know, maybe sometimes the hardest person that you can end up reaching with the gospel is the kid who grew up with, like, in church and couldn't care less because he's heard it a thousand times and it has no effect. So, like, there's, there's a lot of reason to have hope for anyone, because like the, the person you might think most likely to become a Christian may not be what you think, you know? Um, so there, there's a lot of room for thinking and praying about how God actually works and who he wants us to be witness to. What's that? Yeah. Do you think that in general God created an in the neatness of sorts of a potential open mind in every human being? Hmm. Because if and like right, was Cornelius an example of this, because you said he was God a God fearer. Yeah. And no one had even talked about him yet. Mm-hmm. So where did that come from? Right. Yeah, because he's 
Well, yeah, I think there's a couple things. Cause, yeah, so someone like Cornelius must have had some Jewish contact. Same thing with uh, we, the, the eunuch that we talked about last week. Like, he's reading Isaiah. He's not Jewish, and he's reading the Isaiah scroll. So he clearly had some contact with the Jewish world. But then as, as, as far as the innate longing to, like, seek God goes, I do think we have to walk a line because... We live in a fallen world. We're fallen creatures. However, if you believe, like, Romans 1, like, even the, the Gentiles, in certain ways, will follow the law of God as it's written in their conscience and in their heart. They do the things that God would have them do, even as they're walking in darkness. Um, when you look at the pagan world, you see a lot of startling levels of truth at times, because they have... The common grace of God, the, the heavens declare the glory of God, they have a, a, an innate, I mean, they, they have wisdom, that they're able to seek after certain things, and they tend to do it blindly and stumbling all around, lost in their own uh, sin and just di different situations. But there's definitely something that... There's a reason that like, we've never found a culture that doesn't have gods, I think, because there is this human understanding of something enormously larger than themselves and they all seek after it in their own ways and then the claim of the bible is that no like i actually know this god i, I know the the one who is lord over all um so yeah i i would kind of roll with that innateness idea it's just it's tragically flawed you know it, it's it's broken from the beginning from genesis 3 so yeah Okay. Anything else before we close? Okay. Awesome. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this night. I thank you for this time in your word. Uh, I pray that maybe some of the questions brought up, maybe uh, some of the uh, encouragements and just ways to think about how you still move and act and want your message to go out uh, would uh, resonate with us a little bit, make us think a little bit. And I pray that you would just use your word in our hearts, in our lives, uh, how you see fit. So I pray you'd be with us, bring us back safely next week. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.